Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Axe. I'm back on the Pennsylvania A3 switcher this week, and I'm going to finish the crossheads. And there might be some chooching at the end. Very ill-advised chooching, however. When last we left our crossheads, they were looking very crossheady, but still quite a ways to go before they will function correctly. The next operation on these is going to be a series of angle cuts right next to that boss that we turned at the end of the last part of this little mini-series. These are kind of flow features, if you like. They're going to kind of round over the corners in that U-shaped valley on either side of the boss and basically make this look more like the single continuous casting that it would be on the prototype. Of course, on the prototype, this would almost certainly be a massive chunk of cast iron or cast steel, maybe something along those lines. So it would have nice curved transitions between all the different areas. Now that was a tricky series of little cuts. You might wonder how I nailed that so handily. The answer, of course, is the test part. I used it once again to figure out those tricky cuts. Like everything else on these crossheads, though, the machine work is just the beginning. It roughs in the shape, but then there's lots of quality needle filing time required to blend everything together and really achieve the smooth curved effect that we're going for. So far, so good. There's a little more finishing work to do on those yet, but we're definitely in the ballpark. For the next couple of features, I'm going to need some fixturing help, so let's go over to the lathe, and we're going to skip ahead a little bit and make some stainless steel nuts. Got a piece of stainless hex bar stock in the lathe, and we'll knock out some hardware. These nuts will be used in the final assembly of the, for the locomotive, but we're going to make them now because they're also going to be useful for fixturing these parts in the next couple of milling operations that we need to do. As I said in the previous video in this series, this is all strictly following Kozo's suggestions for order of operations in the book. He suggests making these nuts now, and you'll see why momentarily. Of course, chamfer the outsides of those nuts, because chamfers are what separate us from the animals. And then I can part these off. I'm making them in batches of two, because that's essentially how deep I can reach with my tap. What that allows me to do then is use that jam nut on the end of the piston rod in what will be its final position and thread it into the crosshead and lock everything together. Because what we're going to be doing is using the piston rod as the reference along with this parallel block to make sure that the running grooves that we cut on either side of the crosshead are perfectly centered on the piston rod. It's important that we get these grooves well centered on either side of the piston rod because of course the crosshead rails will be centered on the piston bore but that's difficult to do with threads as a centering reference. Threads are always a bad reference because there's a lot of tolerance in them. So I believe Kozo's idea here is that if we just use the piston rod, thread it into where it will be sitting, then wherever that happens to land, depending on how the threads happen to get cut, that is what we want to center on. And so using the piston rod itself as the center reference in this case, even though they are threads, I think does make sense. Now that said, we're still going to do a lot of checking so I'm roughing in the dimensions of the slot on one side, making sure the width is correct. This is final width, but on depth, I've left one finishing cut of space yet to go on that. And then I'll flip this around and do the same cut on the other side, once again, leaving room for a final finishing cut. Because I know even though there's threads, I know they're within probably 10 thousandths of center. So I'll leave, let's say, 15 or 20 thousandths of cut left on each side so that then we can make sure that those final cuts are going to bring everything into center. To ensure that, I'm going to check that on the surface plate. Right before I do my finishing cuts, I check both sides, again using the piston rod as the centering reference on those 1, 2, 3 blocks, and I check the depth of each of these two grooves. If either one of those grooves needs to be cut a couple of thou deeper than the other one to keep everything centered, then this is what will tell me that, and I can go finish it up on the mill. And that seems to have gone really well. I checked them again on the surface plate afterwards, and everything ended up within about a thou and a half of centered. So I think that will be just fine. Those grooves aren't finished yet, though. We need some threaded holes down the centers of them. Very, very tiny threaded holes. These are 080 threads. These are for some tiny screws that are going to hold bearing pads in here, or what the drawing calls slippers. These are linear bearings that are actually going to be riding on the steel crosshead guide rails. We've got 
four of these tiny holes to drill in each of the two crossheads. So I'm using an end stop to speed that up. And then we're going to be threading all of these, as I said, 080. Tapping threads this tiny in steel is never a stress-free experience. When you're doing this with a tap this small in steel, you can actually see the tap twisting. And it's very nerve-wracking, wondering, is this the moment it's going to break? Is this where we find out if these bearing pads are going to be Loctited on because I broke the tap off in the crosshead? But nope, it all went fine. Now we can tap some number one threaded holes in the sides for holding a bracket that holds another part of the valve gear. And after all of those 080 holes, these 164 holes feel positively huge. You can see me taking a moment here to compare because these crossheads are handed, so these threaded holes on the lower side have to be on the opposite side of each of the two crossheads, which is exactly the kind of thing that I always screw up. With those tiny threaded holes complete, now I can make the linear bearings that I talked about that go in here. These are made of bronze, and I've got some pretty exotic stuff for this. This is 510 bronze. This is a, quite a hard alloy of bronze. It's actually made explicitly for linear bearings. That was just a happy coincidence. I ordered this because it was the only alloy of bronze I could get in the correct thickness. This is a 40 thou piece of bronze shim stock that I'm using. And I've rough cut it to size on the bandsaw and then just filed the edges. It wasn't worth side milling all of the edges of these little guys because they're never going to be visible anyway and filing was sufficient. These get drilled and countersunk for those tiny screws that are going to hold them in place. I want the heads of those screws to be well below the surface because as these bearings wear, I don't want to wear into the screw heads. Wouldn't hurt anything because the screw heads are brass. Brass is a good bearing surface also on steel, but if that goes on too long, I won't be able to get the screws out anymore. Although I doubt this locomotive is going to see enough use that that would ever happen. These screws are, I think, the smallest ones on the locomotive. At least I hope they are. They are number zero and just 80 thousandths long. They are tiny. I don't think I could handle hardware much smaller than this on this thing. Moments like this, I understand why people build larger scales. If I could figure out a way to build a larger boiler, I would probably build the next locomotive in a larger scale. Okay, on to the center bolt now that holds the main rod into the crosshead. Now this is not just a mere pedestrian bolt, mind you. This is actually the center bearing of the crosshead. That makes it surprisingly complex. I've got some tool steel here because we are going to be heat treating this. I'm going to face off the end as is tradition. I thought I'd see if I could get away without tail support because then I don't have a center in the end of the part, which might look nicer, but eh, this is cutting okay, but not great. I think I really am going to need tail support, so I went ahead and put a center in it and got the tail support set up. This is kind of right on the edge of where tail support might be necessary, but I rationalized this by thinking actually the prototype would have centers in this part because, of course, it's a big bearing pin. They would have made it between centers on a 1910 lathe, so it would definitely have centers in both ends. And in fact, looking at the photos, Kozos has centers in it as well, so all's well that ends well. I can now turn this piece down to the largest diameter, which is the tapered head on the end of this pin. Then the body of this pin gets turned down to a very accurate dimension that will fit just inside the bearings and the ends of the main rods and the holes in the centers of the crossheads. There's a, just a couple of tenths of tolerance on this, so I'm taking my time and I'm leaving it about half a thou large on the turning tool, and I'll finish that up with emery paper. Tool steel can be tricky to turn, but one nice thing about it is that it sands really beautifully. If you give yourself a few tenths at the end to finish with emery, you'll end up with an incredible finish every time. Something about the toughness of tool steel just makes it really easy to get a flawless finish on it with emery at the end. Really like doing that. Then I turn down the threaded area at the end of this pin a little bit more to give myself some clearance for the die. I never like to cut a thread right on nominal dimension with dies. That never works very well. And then I do a little bit of an undercut at the top of the thread to make sure that the nut is going to be able to seat all the way down against the body of the cross head. And that tool turned up a big ugly burr on either side, so we'll take that down before I do my threading. You can see I've got a really nice polished finish on the body of the pin, and I'm doing my best not to mess that up during the rest of these operations. I want to maintain that high shine finish all the way through the heat treating so that this ends up as a really nice bearing on the inside of that bronze bushing in the main rod. <laughs> 
I can do a test fit now that all those features are done and make sure everything is going to work. There's the crosshead. And the fit on the diameter is excellent. That slides right on there, but there's no slop or anything. That nut almost tightens all the way down, but not quite. There's a little bit too much end float in that. So I need to cut about another quarter or half a thread on there. So I'll do that. Then on to the final feature, which is a 90 degree taper on the head of this. You might recall that the crosshead has a 90 degree countersink in it, and the head of this pin slash bolt thing needs to fit snugly down into that countersink. So using magnification, I'm moving in very slowly until the end of my chamfer tool is just touching that base surface. And then I'm feeding sideways with the carriage until I see that taper just line up with the root of the pin. Magnification is really the key to doing that nicely and really makes it pretty easy. All ready to part off now. This will be my first time trying this new sprung parting tool in tool steel. So let's see how this goes. Lots of lubrication on there and away we go. So far, I've been very, very impressed with this thing. It's really working incredibly well. And I gotta say, even in tool steel, it's not flinching. I'm using lots of lubricant, of course, but it's chewing away at that tool steel. No drama, no grabbing, no weird noises. It's just plowing its way right through. Yahtzee. Lovely. Big fan of that parting blade. Over to the hearth now to heat treat this pin. We're gonna harden it and then temper it. The drawing does say hardening this pin is optional, but it's really easy to do, and you know, it'll make the bearings wear better and make the locomotive run better, so why not? Step one is to heat the pin to a glowing reddish orange. I usually go a little bit hotter than that, right into orange, so that it doesn't cool down before I get the pliers on it and get it into the oil, and then quench it, swish it around, make sure that they aren't getting cavitation bubbles on the surface, keep it moving, and then of course it's going to come out of there a black sooty mess, but that soot just wipes off. Then I clean the pin up and I bring it back for tempering. The pin needs to be clean for this step so that you can see the color on the surface. And this step happens quickly, so I go very carefully. Keep the torch kind of far away and just feather it in there and watch the color on that surface. Once I start to see a little bit of yellowish brown appearing on that surface, then I grab it quickly and dunk it in water to stop the heat soaking at that point. It's very easy to go too far with that because there's an inertia on that heat soak that happens. The water makes sure to stop that in its tracks. And that's a nice kind of yellowish brown color. Looks like a good temper. Let's do some finishing work now, make these things look a little nicer. I've got my Dremel held in the vise and I've got one of those little scotch bright wheels that you can buy in big tubs on eBay and Amazon, places like that. And these things are really great for cleaning up tool marks and file marks little discontinuities in your surfaces, that sort of thing. This trick of holding a motor tool stationary, I actually got from Keith Appleton. He's got a bench mount for his Proxon motor tool, and uh, I don't have something that fancy, but holding my Dremel in a vise gives me a similar effect, and it really, really does help for this kind of thing. It's much easier to have the motor tool stationary and manipulate the little part with your hand. All right, let me show you how all these parts all fit together. So the jam nut goes on the end of the piston rod, of course, and that holds the adjustment length of the crosshead and rod assembly wherever you need it to be for the valve timing and everything to work out. So then the crosshead threads onto the end of that. Those threads give you some much needed adjustment in the length of everything for final assembly and tuning many years down the road probably from now. Then the main rod goes in the end of the crosshead like so, and through that pocket that we made, then the tapered and hardened pin goes in the end like so, and that sits flush with the back of the crosshead, and then the nut goes on the end. On final assembly, that nut will need to be tight enough to hold that pin stationary. The idea is that the pin remains stationary in the crosshead, and the bearing action comes from the main rod rocking back and forth with the bronze bushing on the stationary pin. However, getting that pin tight enough to do that might actually be difficult because there is no head on the back of it. I think the idea is that the tapered head is supposed to seat in the taper on the crosshead and allow you to tighten it, but I'm not really convinced that's going to work, so I may put a little dab of Loctite or super glue or something on that head and a little bit of thread locker on that nut. These crossheads were very, very difficult for me, I'm not going to lie. I would say these were probably the second most difficult thing I've done on the entire locomotive so far, next to the boiler. You may have noticed some weird punch marks on the backs of these, some stamps. Uh, I haven't talked a lot about this yet on this project, but 
all of these parts are all numbered. Every time I fit two parts together, I number them both so that they stay together in that same orientation and relationship for all time. Because this is a handmade model, even though in theory all these parts are interchangeable, in reality they aren't. And then as the locomotive ages and gets used, these parts are all going to run in together, and so you want to keep them all matched as well. In this particular case, you might notice some extra stamps. I actually had to re-stamp and cross out the old numbers on these crossheads because Remember those asymmetrical side threaded holes that I said I always screw up? Yeah, I screwed those up. I put them on the wrong side of both crossheads. Luckily, the crossheads were identical enough that they could be swapped side to side, and so I just kind of crossed out the old stamped numbers and restamped them with their new orientations. Crisis averted. Let's get this all assembled on the locomotive and see how it looks in its final home. Figuring out the exact order of assembly for all of this was quite a challenge. Turns out there is actually an explanation in the book of exactly how to assemble all this, but I had read it and it didn't really click what he was saying, so I spent an hour figuring it out for myself, and then reread the description and realized that he was describing exactly what I had just done. Nevertheless, the crosshead and main rod must be assembled first, then that assembly goes on the driver. Then remember the screwdriver slots and the end of the piston rods? This is their moment to shine. You feed the piston in through the forward cylinder head down through the rear head, through the stuffing box. Once the threads are exposed, then we can get the jam nut on that's going to hold the adjustment length for the crosshead. And finally, we can bring the crosshead up to the piston rod, then feeding a screwdriver in through the end of the cylinder into that slot, we can twist the entire piston and thread the whole assembly into the crosshead. This is kind of surprising that this is how this is done, but trust me, there is no other way to assemble these parts. Every other way that you're thinking of, trust me, I tried it, and there is an interference somewhere between the drivers and the heads and the pins and the... It's just, there's no way to do it, trust me. Nope, stop it. I see you writing that comment thinking you've got another way to assemble this. You don't. I know you think you do. You think you got it all figured out because you watched this little video. You don't know nothing. You don't know. You weren't there. Oh, easy there. That got a little dark. Sorry about that. Anyway, here's the final assembly. Yay! Now a moment of reflection for the true hero of this build, the inanimate low-carbon steel rod. Yes, without this test piece, failure would have been virtually guaranteed, and instead of watching this nice summary and assembly video, you would instead be watching a for sale video for all of my possessions because I have failed at life and there's really no point in carrying on. Now I know what you're thinking because I'm thinking it too. The urge to chooch. Very, very strong right now. But no. No chooch. No chooch for you. I know, the urge is very, very strong. But if we chooch, we risk... I, stop it. We risk bending the piston rods because there's no crosshead rails in place to constrain vertical forces on that crosshead. But maybe chooch? No chooch. Thanks for watching, and thanks to my patrons for making all this happen every single week. See you next time. Little Chooch.